Good to see everyone. Thank y'all for joining us. Welcome in. The other pitch I just wanted to give uh, related to Canvas is that we are starting to put up the uh, kind of discussion questions for each one of these sessions. And so if there are questions you have related to the topics of kind of each training ahead of time, that will help our presenters as well. So please do jump in there and engage in the chat and so we can start those conversations so we can get off on a good start in these sessions. Also, since we have a moment and I was gonna say something at the end, but instead I will say something right now. Uh, so Shareable is involved in a lot of different projects. And one of them that is just coming out today is we have collaborated on the production of a new animated short video, short film about the kind of history and challenges and current potential for rural electric cooperatives. Uh, if you don't know about rural electric cooperatives across the United States, there's 42 million uh, people who own their member owners of their electric utilities. They have governance rights over their electric utilities. It's one of the largest cooperative sectors in the United States. And for the past four years, Shareable has been working with a group of, of about uh, 18, 20 other organizations to support the just transition of these electric cooperatives to um, clean and renewable energy. Uh, Co-ops, uh, they have some of the highest energy prices, nine out of the 15 most uh, fossil fuel polluting uh, energy sources in the United States are electric cooperatives. And they serve 92% of the federally recognized persistent poverty counties in the US as well. So you have people with the least amount of means paying the highest amount for electricity and bearing the brunt of some of the worst environmental pollution from that electricity production. Um, just in the last couple of years, our campaign has been successful at getting uh, almost $11 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act to support that transition of these co-ops, which is a very, it's a historic reinvestment in this infrastructure. And today I'm actually in San Antonio, Texas, where we are premiering this new film, Power to the People. Um, the story of our electric cooperatives. And I've often used the electric cooperatives as an example of a really successful to business market. model over the Employees. decades that instead of just saying, we're going to give some subsidies that will allow rural people to pay money to the big monopoly corporates so they can get electricity, they established the cooperative movement to be able to give them support. They did get government subsidies, but it was government subsidies to create a co-op, which then became a long-term economically viable economic engine for those communities, rather than federal money that would go to the local rural people to pay to large corporations that could raise their rates mercilessly because they would always be sucking more federal money yep. into their pockets. And so it's cool to see taking that to the next level of supporting them in going green. So... It's cool on multiple and multiple levels. All right. Thanks for adding that in, Bill. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. And with that, we have our presenter, Amanda. You've, you've made it in. Thank you guys so much for joining in today. And thank you guys. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience. And thanks for selling, y'all. But I'm Amanda Miller. I am the executive director of the South King Tool Library. Libraries. We do call ourselves Skittle. So if I say that, it's not necessarily the candy that I'm talking about. You can see from... These pictures, I have spawned my mini me's, my tiny humans here. We are, they're, they're my reason, they're my purpose, and the future is why I do things because it, it's an inevitability. There's a, a lot of opportunities. I am humbled to be honored. Just this last week, I was chosen as the hometown hero for the City of Federal Way, and I've been acknowledged by peers and community groups. I am president of the Seroptimist International of Federal Way, a international organization that supports women and girls in their education. And I run a school of 600s PTA. I do a lot of other things in the community, advise the superintendent, work with people of a lot of different backgrounds, do environmental consultation. I spent a decade in supply chain logistics. I uh, ran a distri distribution center for Honda motorcycles and power equipment for 11 years, which is very eye-opening for the experience of that world. Uh, so yeah, I just want to dive in because I'm excited to share with you guys and 
I don't even know how many people do we have. We have 61 people, which is amazing. I'm not that important. I'm just a, I'm a conduit. I'm a vessel here. So you can write my name down. You can write that down, whatever you want to do with that. I use she, her pronouns. And I, I grew up in Southern Virginia, a real place called the Great Dismal Swamp. Not entirely relevant unless you play that two truths and a lie game with me. And then that's really difficult. But yes, that is my son. That is not OSHA certified. He is not supposed to be, he's supposed to be have a helmet or probably not be a baby strapped to my chest while drilling. I tried to lead by example for these guys though. And I have done a couple things that I'm pretty proud of as far as in the realm of tool libraries, lending organizations. I joined the board that was a steering committee at the time to help start a tool library in the South King County. We're in Washington state, of course. And if you don't know much about King County, it's the place where Seattle is, but it's also an extremely diverse area that is represented, underutilized, and amazingly diverse culturally, socioeconomically, South King County especially. My family made the journey to live in Federal Way, and I had only just heard rumors of two libraries. And when I joined the board, I wasn't sure what I was really getting into. Needless to say, in 2019, I became the executive director of the South King Tool Library and helped finish building this building, the big blue box there out of recycled shipping containers. We had a vision, we had a mission to get a tool library into the region, and we did it. We built that building. It took way longer than you would think. Do not recommend Thank you. building out of shipping containers necessarily. They have pros and cons, don't get me wrong, but it was not not as easy as the engineers designed it to be of course so when we decided to try to start another tool library we weren't sure what that would look like it turned out that it was going to be in a mall so i have two kind of divergently they could not be more <laughs> opposite examples of tool libraries and how they can be resources now we say tool libraries but what we mean by that also is we lend a lot of different things. Tools are everything from chainsaws to sewing machines, uh, dehydrators, paper making kits, uh, crickets, um, you know, lawnmowers, all that good stuff. We do talk a lot about, well, tools. We're really a library of things. And I was happy also to connect with Tom and the shareable group because I worked under the several grants that brought us to the iteration of a tool library incubator program. And so we were trying to figure out how to replicate. I've been asked what scale is for tool libraries and programs. And uh, my focus has always been community at the center. It was difficult to say who should run a tool library other than the people that it will serve. And I think that's something that I want to talk to you about in a little while. I'm framing this conversation for folks that are starting out from wherever they are uh, whenever they are, but have not started a tool library. And I am by no means the master of all things tool library. I would consider myself a subject matter expert, which is weird to say. Life is weird and that's what happens. Yeah, I'm proud of these organizations, proud of this organization and where we've gone with it, running both of these locations, amongst many other things, are sort of tenants of Primary principles, you can say, are sharing, training, and empowerment. And all of the grammar folks out there would be very curious to say, why not empowering? Why would you do that? It could be so nice and succinct. But we were really intentional about choosing those three tenants. And that's because empowerment is not something that is going to be transactional. Sharing, you have this one, you can share something simply training you can attend and have training and it can live and breathe and, and be something with you. Empowerment is something that is not a very tangible measurement. And we're pretty proud and like I said, intentional about that being a center focus for us. So we do all these different programs. We started doing repair cafes before we even started tool lending because again, life is weird and we weren't sure how to get going. We didn't have a host to build with. We didn't have all the structures in place, but we knew we needed to start somewhere. And if I can leave you with anything today, if you have to leave right now, then start somewhere is the only thing that I would make sure that you heard. But 
I wanted to just highlight these different programs, these different ideas that we've done because I didn't invent those. I, again, not the singular mind. This is something that has evolved in our community. We partnered with a lot of great organizations, a lot of great collaboration facilitated this, including governments. We have worked under every level of government with grants, contracts for service, and the region that we live in is fairly conducive to this type of effort. So we had really great partner organizations that inspired us and collaborated with us. Just a couple background context, but today uh, we'll be talking about engaging your community and the community at large. So I'm just going to run through, we'll do a little icebreaker. Since we have 60 folks, I probably won't have everyone share in their icebreaker, but then I, again, in my, I don't know, seven years or so with the organization, being on the board, and now as executive director, whenever I don't know where to start, I always go back to the W's. You can't go wrong with trying to figure out the who, what's, when, where, why's, and how's of a project, of, of an aspiration, of a dream here. That's how I've broken up this session to get you your mind in the right framework. First things first, like I said, it's not about me. This is about you. And if you could, if you are available to do this, I want you to do two things. Perhaps if you can get a piece of paper and split it into four sections, then do that. Split it into just four sections, just like any like piece of paper like this and just split it into four sections. Don't worry if it's not perfect, if it's not huge, you can get four sticky notes, whatever you need, but do that. And then also, if you have a second, put into the chat, if you were a super superhero, what would your superpower be? This is an exercise that I do with actually in, in equity work in environmental justice to get a frame for folks in their power. Power is an interesting thing. You get into tools and you talk a lot about power and you start to realize when you work in a community what the power dynamics are that are at play, whether you like it or not, or whether you are party to it or not. If you take a minute, a lot of X-Men is one of my favorite, but I'm a nerd amongst many other things. But Think of what superpower you would choose. Would you want to predict the future? Would you want to have super strength? Would you want to transform into any object? There's all, yeah, there's an endless supply. Uh, oh yeah, that's a good one. Ability to speak and understand all languages. That's a good one. Clock, hold on. <laughs> Teleportation, that's a good one. Speed. Alchemy, ooh, that's awesome. Clone myself in more than one place. Me too. Totally. Time travel. Ooh, calming. Hmm. I love it. Time travel, yes. Understanding others' motivations. Lord, don't we all want that too? Flying. Cool, cool. This is very specific. Manifesting on a horizontal surface. Two-dimensional transformation. Is that cool? Awesome. Oh, abundant man. There you go, Tom. Nice. Oh, I love that. Talk to plants. We're probably pretty close to that, actually. <laughs> All right. You guys, your imagination can run with this. I have kids. My kids are really inspiring to me. If you've not had the pleasure of having kids and you wonder maybe why people do it, I don't know. I know that they are constantly teaching you things and especially things about superheroes, but they are endlessly creative and most of them are not too scary in their interests but it made me start to think about what happens if you have super speed would your clothes catch on fire do you guys see the flash and you guys close caught on fire a couple times what about if you fly there's laws my husband is a big nerd for star wars and star trek and i try not to science it because it ruins it. At least bugs in your teeth would be a problem for anybody that's flying, right? You'd have to get a face shield, all these things. And if you have x-ray vision, or even if you could read minds or understand things beyond what we can already as humans, what would that tell you? Would you want to know? Would you want to be privy to all that information? It's a lot of responsibility. So in that, thinking about your power, your privileges, the position that you are in, internet, 
<laughs> the fact that we have technology and access to programs like this or running water, of course, simple things that we have that we don't really understand what the power and the privilege is and how we can use those for good, of course, but also how it can be a debilitating factor for us as well. It's going to limit us in our ability to understand and relate to folks that may not have that power. So as you're traveling through this journey that you're on right now to serve your community and engage meaningfully, think keep that in mind. Go back to that. How is this power dynamic going to be shaping the conversation, shaping the approach that I'm taking, shaping the group that I've formed or the people that we're serving or as many communities that we connect with, there are very intelligent people that have a lot of different experiences and we can learn so much from them. <clears throat> but we also must take into consideration the fact that we can progress, we can do more, we can do better. And questioning everything is something that I say all the time. Not great when you have kids, also super fun when they're like you, that they are giving that right back to you. Thank you guys for giving, participating in that exercise. And it, it kind of goes into what we're talking about here today too, with the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Those are common questions. Again, my, I think my 10-year-old knows all of those questions and those being the W's, the primary ones that we think of. I think they're out of order for what, especially what we're talking about today, but in general, what I struggle with, if I'm considering a question or a problem, what order am I going to do these in? So do I do the, you know, how and why first, or do I do the what and where first? And there's many schools of thought on the correct approach to this, even the correct order for this. But I <clears throat> like to think of it like this. There's a lot of why involved in every aspect of how and who and when and all these different components of the decisions that you're going to make along the way. So I've reorganized them for today's meanings. Why first, what, when, where, who, how. And that that's, doesn't really, it's not very relative, except that you're going to eventually get to the how with the information that you get along the way. And the most important piece that we are going to talk about right now is the why. Not sure if you all are familiar with the principles of Ikigai. I studied Japanese architecture and gardens at, in college and Chinese archaeology. Again, you don't want to play to truth and a lie with me. It's a weird time. But the principles that come along with Ikigai, of course, are <clears throat> something that we can all relate to. We want to do what we love. We want to, you're here. So I assume you probably want to help the world. And you have skills, you're good at you're good at things, whether you see it or not, whether and have a full inventory of what those are. And inevitably we have to be paid. We have to live in this society. Now, that does not necessarily mean money because life is weird and your your capital, your time capital, your investment in yourself, your social capital, all these things are accumulative and that is a, a form of payment. The way that we create the, the framework of what we're doing, I want you to ask yourself why. Why are you here today? Why are you doing what you want to do? Why are you setting out or why do you run a tool library? I think I set it up so that there's a breakout session next and I did not give you guys like any warning whatsoever. So we might, we're good to go. Okay, we might need a second, but I put some suggestions down. Environmental, most of us, I've talked to tool libraries around the world and the environmental awareness, community awareness, cost, community resilience, my future humans, your future humans, all these things can be a big why. And you don't have to necessarily have it all hammered out. Just the first thing that comes to mind or what your strongest desire is, we can go to a breakout session and maybe have a sharing of what your why is for you, what your why is today. And you might want to write that at the top of your paper too. Um, and if you don't have your why today, if you didn't get a chance to share, or you didn't get to connect with everybody. The reason for, for doing this is mostly just to frame the rest of the session too. Because if you don't know your why, then you can 
run around for quite a, a while in making decisions. It helps to clarify your decisions, helps to give you priorities in the things that you're making. So your why might change. Your why might be something that you discover along the journey too. There's no need to, there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. There's even no judgment in what your answer possibly is. Thank you. The next thing that I wanted to talk about is just the breadth of the, the different types of tool libraries, the different types of libraries of things that exist in, in the community and in the world and those that don't exist. What kinds of things, programs, resources, structures, do you have you know, maybe concrete, maybe established, maybe you see this as a huge need and that is what you're doing. So the what's are the next things that you can consider and think about as you're developing your idea. If you have those really concretely already established, or if you're really open, I would, if you're right at the beginning of developing your structure, your organization, then you're going to need to maybe have some flexibility in that. And that can be based on what is the need and what you get feedback is actually the need. Uh, we don't want to do the thing where we're implanting something that we think is the best thing, uh, but we don't have the insight to get to know what might be better. Here's another sort of easy lift here with when will you have time? You're here right now. Do you have to do everything? Probably not. Hopefully not. It's a good idea. You won't. When are you going to start? Do you have a time frame in mind? Do you have parameters already established for yourself? The smaller the box you start out with, then the more finite you have. The, the larger the box, the more maybe questions and problems you might run into because it's too much, too fast. There was a really interesting conversation I had one time about mission creep. And I've had several conversations since then about that. And I think it's a really fascinating concept to question and poke at myself when I'm starting new endeavors or when I have conversations about my time or the things that are important to me. Thinking and taking inventory. This is just, this is the pre-work to what we're really getting after here. So I'm not going to waste more time. Let's see, can we go forward? Here we go. And then the where, right? Physical space, where are finding your boundaries, as it were. There was something I saw recently, of course, on a Instagram or something along those lines, where there was an ant with a circle drawn around it, and it wouldn't go out of the circle. And these imaginary borders that we have, and there's economic theories and concepts that talk about borders and what it is to have borders to things. But what are your, where are you, you know? Where are you physically? The people that you have, complementary programs. What is around you? Who are the people you want to connect with? Where are they? Since we're focusing on where, but where are those people? <clears throat> are there universities? Are there like-minded groups around you? And where does it make sense to, to begin? There's working in supply chain logistics for me was very insightful. Everyone got to know supply chain logistics during the pandemic when we ran out of toilet paper, amongst other things. And there's a never ending puzzle pieces that we could put together for this structure of where does thing, where do things come from and where their flexibility is. Can you tell me where the pen that you're writing with, the origin where you got it. But then where did that come from? And then how did that get to you? How does that translate into your goals, your mission and vision? So where is pretty important, even in environmental work, besides the fact that you are physically maybe in a space and confined by borders of sorts. But what are the parameters you're setting for a where to? I was going to do another breakout, but I think I'm going to wait because really this is a personal exercise for you all to do now or later or over and over again. And this is something that if you're writing it down right now, if things are coming to mind or really if they're not, because I just won't stop talking and then that's fine too. You can come back to this later. It's very simple principles of 
the W's to visit for help helping you to make decisions. Another sort of the biggest other W, I think, when it comes to making decisions and starting and engaging folks is the who. And that's really the nexus of this session, right? We're talking about our community and engagement and how we get folks to engage. And seeing who is present, who are your supporters, who are your inspiration, who serves as your neighbors, whether you know them, you've ever spoken to them or not, they're part of your social network. And understanding or getting to know or relating to those different entities can help frame and be a huge proponent to your success or failure and your capacity to adapt. Knowing the partners in your community, knowing the, the leadership, knowing how you are going to talk to folks that maybe don't agree with you on every level of uh, politics or purpose or mission and vision, understanding that the who people bring everything that they have ever done with them when they come to you and they're talking to you on any given day. And they might be having a really bad day and they might be going through a lot. How are you going to talk to all of these people? Who are the people that need the things that you are going to bring to your community, bring and serve in your community? How this shapes, and if you don't have this in mind, then there's a huge gap that you will run into. And I'm spending a lot of time very intentionally, slowly talking about this because I want it to really resonate and be a a something that you value or or take and understand because you are starting on a new journey today whether you are starting at a library or not today is a new journey today is a day you're going to have to figure out how to talk to all sorts of different people and engage with them so understanding the who is terribly important <clears throat> let's see ah yeah this is a good one there's also who is missing, um, who is not at the table, who is not in leadership, who is not reflected in the partners you've established, the supports that you've created, who are the people that don't have a voice, don't have the representation. This is silly, but the PTA, you guys, I'm old now, but I remember the PTA growing up. Parent Teacher Association. Super cute, right? When I joined in my kids' school, I was really excited, but also, oh, I'm not that mom. The organization was actually renamed PTSA, Parent Teacher Student Association, because the students understood that they needed to have a seat at the table too. And eventually it got big enough where everyone understood this. And again, if you can't relate to it, it's fine. But there's so many folks that are missing from our tables, missing from leadership, from the decision making, from a presence that you would inherently have if you just hosted things on the internet. No offense to at all. But if you just have digital connections with people, then you are going to miss out on the people that maybe don't have that ability or that uh, advantage or just didn't see the event or couldn't get to it somehow. We're not already in that circle. So Understanding and questioning who is missing, who are we not seeing come to our uh, events and come to our programs, who's not participating in conversations. Um, one more breakout. I think I do want to do one now. I know it's hard to try to get everybody. So maybe if you talked at the last one, you let someone else talk at this one. Don't feel the pressure, but let's do five minutes and just especially talking about the who's and who we feel like um, we are able to connect with in our community really easily and who maybe it's a challenge to connect with because that if you don't understand your shortcomings, if you don't understand the problems that you're going to encounter, who's not participating in conversations, then you, you might not be doing all the work that you could do. So take five minutes and we'll 
go to a breakout real quick and talk about the who's. Everyone's going to have a full report at the end of this, right? We're going to, it's a test. You must come up with the, no, there's no, not the best answers. All right, are we back, Bobby? Mostly, okay. All right, no time to waste here. The next W is how is what we all want to know. We all want to know the hows, right? There's websites dedicated just for how to start libraries of things, how to start tool libraries, how to start in your community libraries of things. But I bring to you, you want to take a picture of this, a screenshot, this will be shared with you later. But some of the hows that you want to consider as you are starting out a new, even program, how are you going to react to the, the failures, the funding shortcomings or sustainability questions or successes? How do you celebrate those? How are you going to convince people to join you? Elevator speeches and two minute videos are terribly popular in our culture right now, but how do you make them impactful? How do you make them meaningful? And how are you going to promote your ideas? What makes your idea so good? Relating to people is another question. There was a great tip from a library friend of mine that said, did you know that with the AI, you can convert things to a fourth grade reading level? And thinking about classes and workshops that I'm writing descriptions for, maybe for a grant or for uh, approval with a collaborator, folks that want to understand what the class is about, having it written in very simple language helps prevent idioms, metaphors, things that they might not understand if English is their second language, or if you're translating it into a different language, what that could be. The in intentionality of the hows are terribly important, but deciding what governing principles you have with regard to Yes, Hemingway's is the is a great app, but how you decide to present this information, how you respond to questions as an organization when you grow, that is a big question and problem with the more people you bring on, the more opportunities you have. And when you try to get people engaged, when you try to find the right people, find the missing link, you have to do that inward work to see what you're missing. The who is also extends into yourself. Who are you to bring this to the community as, as a steward, as a, a leader? So having to do the work on yourself and introspectively uh, for folks to relate to it, for you to understand uh, you're the idea person and not the organization structure person. It's, it's a deep conversation to have even on your own. This is a great quote that I harken back to all the time. It was originated with the disability rights movement is prevalent, but something to just keep in mind when framing decisions and framing your context equitably is really making sure you are not doing a, a saviorism, doing something that is going to be without the engagement and investment of people. The biggest way to alienate people is to tell them what they need can tell you that from having children again. They will tell you what they want. And if you tell them what they need, they completely disagree. But on a on an adult level, it is uh, one of the biggest missteps that we make generationally as, as a white, maybe neurodivergent person. I have to question myself constantly to make sure that I'm doing the right thing with people and not for them especially in the work. So <clears throat> engagement, you've really been working on this the whole time. We've been talking about this the whole time because you have to have the framework to create meaningful engagement. You engage by doing all of these things. You create the foundation, the structure. There's a reason that nonprofits, books and websites and years of study are dedicated to organizational development and business models range widely for our programs on an international scale. Also, when you're recruiting your leadership, it's important to have them also join in and do this work. It's not easy. And while you do want to have talented leaders, 
key leaders, filling gaps that you need, making sure everyone is on the same page is terribly important. We talk about needs assessment. The shareable survey that we've done has been really helpful for that. That's one way you can do passive surveys. You can creatively partner, make more partnerships that are meaningful, but asking for help and starting somewhere, going to where people are and meeting them is a meaningful way to engage. Uh, being intentional, mindful, like all these lovely L-Y words, being accessible. What does that mean? We work to be a barrierless model at the tool at the South King Tool Library. There are barriers that we do not know exist and that haven't even been put up yet. So constantly going back and iterating on that. So always go back to my Angelou's wonderful quote, doing the best you can until you know better. And then when you do, when you know better, do better. So working to engage with everyone, finding leadership in the spaces that you want to connect with, organizations that are already maybe working with people in that meaningful way, because you're not going to be able to do everything. You do not have the connection to cultures that are beyond your breadth. And you can have a terrible misstep by trying to, again, make that assumption or not take that into consideration. You're going to have reluctant people too. You're going to have questions and framing how you react to those will can be your death or success. And you can also do that with programs that create those pathways for people to engage with you. Because if you don't know where people are, then you don't know how to get to them. That's really all I have for you today. This was about you and your start, your beginning, your community. I can't tell you how to engage with your community. I was jokingly saying, Tom, this is a blank presentation that I get to give because I don't know most of you on this call. And I don't think I'll probably get to talk to all of you, but you have to do the work now. And you have so much that you can take reference from and within yourself to help you guide that. Um, I have some really cool books here that I would suggest to anybody that's starting in this work, starting in this realm, and there's many more that can help lead you that. But don't let the fact that you haven't checked a box or read a book or done this be a mitigation to you starting. You've already started. If you wrote the paper, if you did anything at all today, you thought about any of these questions, you did it. So you've started, you have a pathway forward because you have some framework of an idea and it's already being progressed. So what's the next step? What are you going to do next? All right. Yeah. Those there questions? I know failed at getting question time in before two o'clock, but I can stay here and yeah. Thank you guys again for your time. Yeah. So thank you so much for starting us off with really those key questions where to begin. What are those questions to ask yourself? and your group, because hopefully you're doing this with other folks than beyond just yourself. We have another session next week where we will be going right into the actual maintenance of an acquisition um, of, of items. But between now and then, I want to invite people to pose any questions coming out of the session that you have as you were doing your four corners work and documenting some of that stuff for yourself. Feel free to post it in the the discussion forum for this first session. And if you want any feedback on that, I'm sure Amanda, you'll be willing to hop in and support and, and other folks that have been running libraries of things are in a great position to do so as well. Do you want to make sure we honor everybody's time? And with that said, so if you need to hop off, please feel free to jump off. But Amanda, you also said you'd be willing to stick on for a few minutes and let's just try to keep it to a handful of questions, 10 minutes max for those that want to stay on and ask you any questions. Definitely. Especially if I did not make any sense at some points. I, like I said, am a neurodivergent person and sometimes it makes sense to me, but what the heck am I talking about? Yeah. Thank you guys. Oh my goodness. I'm trying yep. to read the chat yep. too. Question yep. Thank you for putting that in, Bobby. Yep. <laughs> uh, I also was going to say that we are going to be putting this slide deck onto um, Canvas. And we'll be posting the recording of this session, most likely tomorrow, uh, and then the transcript from this from the session uh, a couple of days later.
Ooh, book list. I got you. <laughs> Yeah, does your course have a, a reading, required reading already, Tom? Do we have? <laughs> we don't, but I think starting a, a reading thread, discussion thread for resources would be great. Absolutely. Uh, Amanda, you mentioned needs assessments and needs surveys. Mm -hmm. The thing that you've done up there in South Cape. Yeah, so we have done a few different things. We do take a lot from data that's collected by different institutions and communities, but we've just done casual surveys, talking to folks as they're bringing things back, as they're participating in other programs. We'll do, have a debrief after, and almost always we'll write reports detailing, you know, pros and cons and information about, you know, what went wrong, what went right, what we could do differently next time. But those, all of those things compound on it. How did you hear about us is a question that you can ask in about, uh, that took me like three seconds to get out. That way it tells you some pathways, how people are engaging. I had 540 people drive through our, for our recycling event that happened on the 24th. That's 540 people that drove past the tool library. We opened in the mall in October because that was a decision that was made by community members in Auburn, but there's reported 6 million visitors to that mall every year, which is wild. Not all malls are doing okay, uh, but they have built-in foot traffic. There are people that are connecting that every single time we are there. What? I've never heard of a tool library. This is a brand new idea. We have a gigantic eight foot by eight foot box light in front of our gate to draw people's attention. And then we put a sign into the mall too that just says, what is a tool library? Because that's a million people. The needs assessments that we do come from surveys that are live on our website. What classes, workshops do you want to have? Also, again, after checkout, we have a survey folks can answer, helps give us feedback and can help us report for data on metrics for grants. And then we also do transactional emails with our checkouts and asking folks to share their projects, pictures, pros and cons about tools or what they were working on. Yeah, that's trying to not do all of the work ourselves by taking data from other projects, like Tom or even the city's needs surveys when they do their comprehensive plans helps to guide what the need is. Even working with haulers like waste management to understand what people want to have in the community. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Questions. Yeah, Trissa, if, if you want to come off mic, feel free to. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. I have a question because in in talking to some of the community members here where I am, that the thread that seems to be among everyone is, oh no, we can't do this because people will either bring the stuff back trashed or won't bring it back at all. And I'm just curious if that is actually something that's like super prevalent or it's just a, a one-off thing because it was universal in this assumption that was going to be the case, but it's not an assumption I share. So I just wanted to check. Thank I you. I see people it's shaking smart. their heads and I see, it. yeah, it's a prevalent question. <laughs> it's something that people ask all the time. So I keep well in my pocket after being open for a year, I looked and compared. We have a less than 2% incidence of non-return. That's how I phrase it. And that's what I say. Things die. We are a testament to planned obsolescence. We are a exercise in terminality. We are a testament to manufacturing short communes. There are, it's going to die. How it dies, when it dies, it would be great. There are a lot of organizations, there are several tool libraries that have been partnered with tool manufacturers. And it's interesting because they, I feel like I haven't talked to them too much, but I'm like, do they ask you like, how's it going with that whole chainsaw? Do you, do they like talk to you about that kind of thing? Uh, working in manufacturing or with manufacturers, they don't, don't care that much. But I whispered that they don't really care. 
much, honestly. There's they would sooner drill holes into the engine blocks and have you recycle the metal than to put things into the full use of their potentials. Maximizing their time, things are gonna happen. We have a more altruistic investment in our neighbors. Coming back, can I say this all the time with all their fingers and toes attached because it gets people's attention because you could go into Home Depot and buy the absolutely wrong thing for the project that you're working on, your physical ability, or the circumstances beyond your control. How does Home Depot make sure they are getting the things back? They're not getting the things back. They're making sure that they're making the money that they have to make. And those are the, that's a system that we've created. So if we want to reimagine this system, that's broken because we have this linear economy to create a more sustainable circular economy. We need to have things like this. So anyway, does anyone else want to answer? Because I've been talking for a while. I'm going to just hop on that real quick and say, when I was doing research before co-founding the tool library in Asheville, I went around and talked to a number of different existing tool libraries. And one of them was in Oakland, California, which is tied to the public library system. And so basically anybody who has a library card and can demonstrate that they live within the city of Oakland is able to become a member and there's no other barriers to joining, right? So 300,000 potential members for their tool library. And I asked them about that exact question. What happens with loss and damage, right? Like, how do you account for that? And they told me this was back in 20... Uh, 13, I want to say that per year on average, they had about $4,000 worth of lost and broken tools. Um, but because they did collect late fees for checkouts, they had over $12,000 of income from the late fees, which more than made up for any loss and damage that they had. And it was just a part of the cycle. Yeah, I was similarly going to say you build that depreciation into your model, whether it's repair and bringing tools back in using donated tools in terms of replacements. Theft is actually really minimal. And if you can create wording and communication where you're really not coming at people about, hey, we need this back, and you're saying, we want to make sure we get this back for the next person on our community. And you come at it with making sure that we don't really care. We understand that projects take longer than you were planning. We've had things come back five years after they were checked out because we just put out a blast to people and said, hey, we found that this was still out. Hey, is this accurate? Because there will also be inaccuracies, inaccuracies in your inventory as things are coming in and out, right? And Everything came back and they said, I totally forgot. I had this in my thing. We changed our email address, what have you. And all those tools came back with a beautiful donation on top of it. So I think it's just knowing that you're building this larger community and prepping for those materials to go. And more often than not, the issues don't come from the users themselves, apart from ongoing mm -hmm. repair needs and, and maintenance needs with the tools. But the theft has traditionally within at least tool libraries been from outside communities breaking into kind of a more retail access piece. So when there's been big loss in this field, that's where it's been. It's been from an outside group or individual versus from within the user base. And this and has been a perfect, well, I was going to say, this has been a perfect transition to our session next week, where we'll be really getting into these questions that Jason will be leading. Any last things before we, we close out? I, I was just going to say, <clears throat> Kate is exactly right. You create a network of trust within these things. And we've talked about this as a... I've talked about this a lot with other organizations and groups, but what how you create that is, again being intentional about that and being accessible and equitable is pretty darn important for my organization and for a lot of us because the requirements and the barriers that people have to creating that that's probably a whole nother total session but again getting this framework this balance this jump off point where you have those values established can only make you succeed when it comes to programs that you establish and creating 
the policies that you have. So, yeah, it, it's wonderful. Yeah, to to be part of this community too, because we we're all about sharing, and so then we all end up like sharing these ideas and sharing perspectives and sharing successes and failures. So, yeah. Thank and you I'm guys not sure if there too. Yeah, I'm just saying, this is a Dagan's question. I don't know if there is an aggregated data about that loss and damage, but that's something we could do a micro poll on in this collab just to get some some base data to to, walk, to move off of. But as you've heard, it's it tends to be very minimal in the grand scheme of things. All right, I want to we're going to close this session out. We've got another session that we're working on actually that a bunch of people are sticking around here that we're moving on. We've got the fellows that are going through this program. Um, so I want to make sure we jump over to that session. And for everyone that joined us, thank you again for, for coming to this first session. It was great to have you. Thanks for sticking around for this extra bonus 15-minute time. And please do continue this conversation on Canvas, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.